All right. Welcome to episode 48 of the Jake Blanchard podcast. Before we dive in, shout out to Fellowship Brand Premium Men's Grooming Products. I feel spoiled, man. They send me some of the best smelling oils, waxes, balms, and butter. My beard is healthy. It's soft. uh, And it's because they work nonstop. Uh, They're developing scent profiles and just making amazingly consistent products. Uh, Order some and you'll see like it's it's unlike anything else out there. Fellowshipbrand.com is the website. JBP, that's JBP, like Jake Blanchard podcast, uh, gets you 10% off of your order at checkout. My guest today is Dr. Brad Ballard, aka Dr. Brad. Uh, He's a performance coach for men. And he helps high achieving professional men spiritually grow and personally develop so that they can succeed at work and win in life. Uh, Through his coaching program, his podcast, his best selling book, he equips high achieving men with strategies to live life and simultaneously uh, have success and fulfillment by teaching him or teaching them the three steps of elite performance blueprint. I can't wait to hear a little bit more about that. And in case that wasn't enough, Dr. Brad uh, is also a double boarded uh, sports medicine physician and regenerative medicine specialist. That's where that whole doctor thing comes in. <laughs> uh, and he's worked for multiple professional teams, uh, including prior service as an assistant team doctor to the NBA's Dallas Mavericks. And if you're in the Dallas area, he's a regular guest on Dallas Fort Worth radio talk show, Inside Sports Medicine. That's on that ESPN Dallas station at 1033 FM. Dr. Brad, what's up, man? Thanks for being on the podcast. Man, that sounds too official. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening and I'm like, who is this guy? It sounds too official. You know, Jake, you and I got a chance to, to, to meet and, you know, kind of know one another. And I'm like, let's just get to it. That's all that formality stuff, man. I let's. Know. Let's dive in. You know, I love to give a good intro, man. I think it's really important. I think that you've, uh, you've built a career doing all kinds of things. You can tell yeah. that there's just kind of some avenues and some branches there. You've gravitated towards your interests, and I think it sets it up really nicely. Uh, and starting with that, man, how's Texas? We're good down here in Texas, man. I mean, other than the snowvid, you know, the snowmageddon that happened a few months ago, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, when you know uh, things kind of got turned upside down because of all of the the snow that we had and the you know sub sub freezing temperatures, which is just crazy for us. Other than that, man, we bouncing back. We're we're, we're doing fantastic, man. Hey, and from a uh, from a medical standpoint, you're a non operative uh, musculoskeletal specialist. What yes. really does that mean? So. There's several different avenues to sports medicine in terms of how you can practice sports medicine. And if you think about two big branches, it's you've got surgical sports medicine. So you've got your orthopedic surgeons, and then you've got people who practice sports medicine, but they're non-surgical. And so all those big words just basically mean I practice sports medicine and help people uh, who are active and people who are athletes really you know, get back to the field of play or increase their performance with non-surgical means. So that's still procedural. There's a lot of injections. There's a lot of kind of non-surgical procedures that are in there and uh, collaborating with physical therapists and stuff like that to get people better. But uh, I do not get into the operating room. And if it gets to a point that if I'm seeing an athlete or a patient and they need surgery, well, then that's when I rely on my surgical partners to do their thing. But ironically enough, most of what we try to do is non-surgical because if you think about it, we're trying to keep guys on the court or on the field of play. So if we can, you know, we try to do that because if they're on the operating table, nine times out of 10, they probably won't be on the, you know, on the court or on the field of play. So is this stuff like stem cells as well? Like, or, or what do they call it? Uh, PRP. I don't know the difference between the two. I think it's all, is it, that's not the same thing, is it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly in my wheelhouse. Yes. Okay. So I do stem cell injections. Uh, I do PRP injections. And so that's the regenerative medicine piece that I do. So, um, you know, basically we try to use the body's uh, ability to heal and decrease inflammation uh, you know, for injuries that happen for different joints and soft tissue areas of the body. So, um, 
just kind of a, to try to keep things somewhat simple, uh, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. We draw your blood. We spin it down. When we do that, we can take the concentrated plasma from that. We leave behind the red blood cells, and we can inject that in an area to try and promote healing. Uh, and I say promote healing, not regenerate, car not, not like grow new cartilage. It's not what we're doing. Um, but that tries to help promote and create an environment for healing in an area that's uh, that that might be degenerated or or injured and then stem cells are very similar and there's a couple different areas where we harvest stem cells one is fat the other is bone marrow i do more bone marrow but um that's simply by preference and and uh ease of being able to harvest the cells but we get that we harvest those cells and then we inject that in an area again to try and help uh promote healing. So yeah, that's part of what I do. That's fantastic, man. And uh, so did you, uh, as a lad, as a young lad thinking back, is that, uh, do you always want to uh, um, work in the medical field? Or is this something that you kind of ended up kind of gravitating to later in life? You saw people were injecting platelets into people and you're like, <laughs> hey man, I got to do this. Man, I wish I was that smart when I was young, Jay. <laughs> you know, I wish I had it figured out. I'm still trying to figure this thing out, man. But no, man, it couldn't be further from, from what my path was on. As a matter of fact, what probably the only thing in sports medicine that I was involved in was sports. That, <laughs> there was no medicine okay. uh, that was on my radar. So um, all that mattered to me when I was younger was NBA or bust. Like I was playing for somebody's NBA team. I was going to play D1 basketball. Uh, I was a pretty good athlete, grew up in the Houston area, played ball then. But the unfortunate truth was I was injury prone. And so I ended up getting um, meniscus surgery right out of high school. And my physician, my surgeon was one of the assistant team physicians for the Houston Rockets. And so I remember walking inside that clinic and it was adorned with jerseys with Hakeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler and oh, yeah. Mario Ellie and Mad Max and all these guys that I grew up watching and the championships that they, you know, the championship uh, trophy pictures and all of their signatures. And I'm walking, I'm like, this is dope. Like, yeah. this is pretty cool. And I uh, got my MRI and surgery and all that stuff there. And it just kind of planted a seed that I didn't realize it happened. So, um, you know, I went to college with, I mean, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I was gonna fail. Because for me in high school, academics was just a means to an end. Like I, I just needed to, to, you know, do well enough so that I can play. I needed to do well enough so that my parents would not give me, you know, <laughs> would not give me hell and be like, you can't play. So I studied enough to get A's and B's, but it was only so I could play ball. Well, ball's out the picture now. You're going to college because I wasn't ready to work. My parents were like, look, either you're going to work or go to college. I was like, I don't feel like working yet. So, um, so yeah, I went to college with zero confidence, knew I was going to fail. Uh, I was so fearful of failing that I studied my butt off and did better in college in my first semester than I ever did in high school. So there was this aha moment. That was a light bulb kind of moment of, man, if I actually put in the same degree of hard work yeah. <laughs> that I did on the court into academics, this just might work. Yeah, and that's, um, that's an amazing moment in life. I, I have a very similar moment where it's just kind of like it's it's I liken it to like being a kid riding a bike like your, your parent is behind you and they're, they're running you down the sidewalk and then they let you go. But you don't know they let go yet. And you're still on it. And you look around and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this. <laughs> like This yeah. is me. This is me now. Like I'm I've got the pen. I can I can write the story. Well, and it's that and it's just, you know, I could just remember you know, my college roommate at the time, he was like, why do you study so much? And I was like, dude, like, I'm gonna fail. Like, I'm not gonna do well if I don't. Like, I have to. Yeah. And then you start realizing like, dude, I'm getting grades that I never got before that guys that I looked at who I thought were, you know, however you want to define smart, is having, I was like, huh, so this is how that works. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so, you know, that was a, a, a confidence booster for me that maybe, just maybe, I could be in, uh, you know, can kind of fit in a class that I didn't think I was worthy of at first. Okay. Um, and then at the time, I had a professor that saw something in me. I had no idea what Dr. Gardner saw in me. She was this little tiny lady. She would just, you know, she would just, you know, at the time I would be like, she's bothering me. Like, why are you asking me to like come to these meetings for these honor societies and stuff like that? For whatever reason, man, she saw something in me. I was just a quiet guy in the back just trying to get my work done. And, uh, you know, she would encourage me. She would tell me like, you know, I, I know you can do it. By the time I, you know, graduated uh, college, I was uh, speaking. I was speaking to hundreds of people, taking leadership roles and stuff like that, stuff I'd never done. So part of that college um, experience was understanding the value of hard work placed in academics and um, having people who believed in me way more than I did. And so I needed to, I was, an, I was a broke college kid, needed to start making money. My brother at the time was working as a nurse in the hospital, my older brother. I went to him and was like, I need a job. Like, I'm broke college kid. Got me a job working at the hospital. And again, I had some doctors there who just kind of took me under their wing. And I got a chance to see some orthopedic surgery. And uh, I never forget this guy rolled up in a, in a Dodge Viper, Jake. Like, <laughs> what color? I never. <laughs> Come on, give me a color. Dude, red. The I'm red? talking about like, you know, yeah. that, that red, that red that's like sports car red. Yep. And on the back of his, and on his, his uh, license plate said Bone MD. And I was like, all right, if I'm going to do this thing, that is, is what I want to do. And my mind immediately went back to that clinic, looking at all the jerseys. And I was like, if I'm going to do medicine, if I'm going to go spend all this time, money, effort, and energy, it's going to be that. I want to help athletes like, like the way I was helped. And um, yeah, man, you know, that was when I said, you know what, I think I want to do this. And uh, the mentors pushed me and, you know, I ended up getting into medical school. That's awesome. So you grind your way through medical school. Yeah, you start practicing medicine. How'd you end up uh, working with the Mavericks? <laughs> yeah, this is crazy. So, um, yeah, medical school was not fun. <laughs> Learned a lot of stuff, you know, uh, built some good relationships with, you know, some good people. But I mean, it was, you know, it was difficult, man. I mean, it was really difficult. Uh, got through. So I uh, originally went in to do orthopedic surgery, I actually went in to be a surgeon. But I started taking call and and my wife and I were recently married. And at the time, it was just taxing, dude, it was just it was not healthy for my marriage. And when I was in training, so I was like, I don't know if I want to do surgery. But I went back to my emergency emergency room days. That's where I that's where I worked in the hospital whenever my brother got me a job working in the emergency room as a tech. So <clears throat> I was like, I think it'd be cool to be an ER doctor and I can still practice sports medicine if I get a fellowship in non-surgical sports medicine. So that's exactly what I did. And um, <laughs> I, was a, I was doing my sports medicine fellowship in Pennsylvania and I wrote a letter, kind of like a cover letter of everything, the value that I could provide as a doctor. And I sent that to several clinics, not several, more like 50 different clinics in the Austin, Houston, and Dallas area. I got three calls back. Two were like, thank you, no thank you. Another one was basically like, yeah, we'll, you know, um, we like you to come down. And it was the clinic that I currently work for. Now, mind you, at the time, Jake, this was 2011 when they were making a run for the championship. Okay. So, the Mavericks were making a run for the only championship that they have, and I was watching it. So I remember thinking as I was watching them, this playoff run. They won it that get, year, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they yeah, won. Yeah. They won it. They beat Cleveland, right? I, th I, I think they, yeah, they, no, I think that's when they beat the Heat. I think that may oh, have that's been right, right, that's right. They, I know they lead, beat a LeBron James team. That was a, that was a like four zero or four one sweep. Like it was a that was a that was an awesome year. Yeah, yeah, and. I'm watching this and I tell my wife, I'm like, dude, there's no way 
there's no way me coming out of training that this that this clinic is going to take a f- doctor coming right out of training to work with them. They're winning the championship for heaven's sakes. You know what I'm saying? And man, my wife drew the form. She was like, I don't know. Something tells me that when they meet you, something's going to happen. So man, again, we were, you know, just fellowship trained. I had a daughter. I was, you know, I was broke again because I mean, that's what you do whenever you train before you start really getting out there and practicing. And we scrounged up some money to come down to Dallas, met the head team physician who now, you know, are my partners and, uh, they were like, you know what, dude, we weren't even looking, but uh, we liked you so much, we're going to bring you on. And it was just crazy because here was, here was how it came full circle. Dude, I used to have dreams so vivid of being in an NBA locker room when I was in high school. I mean, it was like crystal clear. It was crystal clear. And I put those dreams on the shelf. I was like, that's done because you know, my basketball career was done. And I will never forget when I finally came down and I started working the following season, they had already won the championship. So they were on the high, they were coming down from that high. And when that fall season started in 2011, after they won the championship, I remember being in the locker room and it was nostalgic, man. I mean, I was, I was envisioning in real time what I had envisioned when I was in high school you know, pounding up Dirk, you know, Vince Carter was one of the guys that was, you know, and yes, Vince Sanity. And I'm sitting here like, dude, the dream came true in a way that I had never thought it would have done. So how it came true and when it came true were completely unexpected, but it did. And um, yeah, man, it was crazy. Do you still support the team today or do you do that for a couple of years or what, what, what was that duration like? Yeah. So that was the first uh, four years of my career. So uh, the way it works is our, our clinic, um, we, we were the team physicians for the Mavericks, but you know, that's only a subset of patients. I mean, it's only 15 guys and they aren't, they aren't always hurt. So that doesn't, oh, on, that, <laughs> that doesn't fund a practice, right? So, uh, you know, you still got to see other patients. You got to see guys like you and myself, right? Guys who are, you know, kind of the weekend warriors and, and athletes and high school athletes some college guys. And so, um, you know, we, we were still building the practice and everything. And it got to a point where basically me and my partners were like, I think our, I think our run here is, it, it's been good, but it's time, to, yeah. it's time to step away. And we all collectively said, you know what, uh, let's just continue building the practice. My, the lead team physician had been there for 20 years. So he had kind of gotten to a point to where I think, you know, he was just like, yeah, I think it's just time to kind of step away. And, and we did. And, uh, you know, uh, we parted ways and, you know, Cuban found, you know, someone else. And, uh, you know, we still have a good relationship with him, but we're just not their, their, their primary, you know, medical, uh, you know, who they lean on for medical uh, care. Oh, for sure. So, I mean, we're, we're going on this arc here, right? So, yeah. You know, early days, didn't really think about being a doctor, got exposed to healthcare, went to school, grinded, became one, hit the locker yep. room, living the dream. Now you're yeah. in practice. Um, at some point in time, you decided to start coaching. Uh, of course, yeah. you know, somebody who's a, a lifelong athlete, sports enthusiast becomes a coach at some point in time. Yeah. Uh, and, but you're coaching, you're coaching men. And so yeah. take me through that. Like what, what were the experiences that shaped you to want to put yourself in that position to pour into others? Yeah, man, that's a great question. So as I've reflected on, you know, my life, looking back, a lot of it has been, there's pains that I've experienced and then I've been like, I want to help other people, you know, um, either manage that pain or get through that pain. So if you think about how I became a sports medicine physician, it was all based on what had happened to me between me being injury prone, the surgeries that I had, you know, as a good athlete, but just couldn't get past, you know, part of the injury bug, you know, I then became a physician who wanted to be in the seat helping the person who was me, right? And so as this coach thing happens, again, I never, you know, 
I didn't even know what, you know, coaching was in terms of like, you know, the, the kind of the, the personal development coaching world. I mean, I didn't even know what it was, but to, to even say that, oh, I want to be a performance coach for men. Like, no, what, what happened was, man, you know, I'm a hard driving guy, man. I mean, you know, I had aspirations of making some really big things happen in my career, just in my life, you know, attacking, you know, things to achieve success and, you know, kind of create this vision for how I wanted life to be. And as I started building my practice, I was working in the ER, I was building my practice, I had a small home-based business, and it was all the Dr. Brad show. Like, it was just like, I'm out here getting it. I'm out here being successful. Uh, But all of it was for me. All of it was to just you know, kind of exalt myself and look at the trophies that I've achieved, right? And I became so driven, so singularly driven in one area of life in my career and business that I found myself neglecting everything else that mattered. So, you know, I mean, it all looked great outside looking in. I mean, you know, Dr. Ballard, he's, you know, wife and a couple kids. Heck, might as well throw in the white picket fence in there. You know what I'm saying? Nice car, cool vacations. But, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was outwardly successful, but I was secretly stuck. It was like, you know, I had finally gotten to this point that I wanted to in, in my career and I'm on Mount Everest. Like I've been climbing this thing forever and I finally get there and the view just isn't nearly what I thought it was going to be, dude. Yeah. The, the thing is like in, in I, doing this podcast and I've been talking to uh, you know people like yourself that are just charging hard at life and whatever I've heard a couple of these types of stories and I can relate myself mm-hmm. if the vision or the goal or the thing is you yes you will, you will run out of mountain to climb <laughs> you you will like it, 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 it you don't know when but you will run out of mountain <laughs> and you will yeah. be at the top of wherever you are mm-hmm. and then it's just downhill yeah, um, because it's hard to get out of that mindset unless you you change your anchoring point, what you're focused on, and how you're focused on it. So I I, I love that you used Everest just there. It, it, dude, uh, dude, and you said something huge: the anchoring point. Like, what are you anchored to? Like, what's what's the anchor? And for me, it was just more. Right, the anchor was more. And at some point, that sucker keeps moving. <laughs> it's not really anchored to anything, but more and more just keeps moving. And yeah, man, I mean, like, so you know, the things that I mean, I, I lost my faith. I lost, you know, my, you know, my family, almost lost my, my wife and kids, you know, my physical health wasn't optimal. And I just ended up looking in the mirror and it just got to this point, like, dude, you are completely not the guy that you had envisioned and, you know, once wanted to be, you are winning at a high level in one area of life. Like you, that's it. You are career success, but you are stuck. And you are even still stuck in in what you do for work to some degree, but also in personal life. And it just got to a point where I was like, dude, I, I've got to figure this out. Like, I don't understand how I worked so hard to get here. And it's not nearly as fulfilling as I thought it was going to be. Like asking questions like, is this it? So there kind of started the journey of me really doing a lot of self-reflection and just trying to kind of figure that out. And over the course of a few years, you know, and through the help of, of coaching, you know, people coaching me, great guys coaching me and kind of walking me through things. Man, I got on the other side of, of this thing and of this struggle and challenge and started realizing like, I really want to help some other guys get past this because man, in our world, in this professional world, <laughs> uh, people who are looking to achieve and win and, and, and you know, do things at a high level, it is very common that we will do it at the expense of everything that really keeps us, you know, being, you know, great men, husbands, fathers, business owners, leaders, um, if we don't watch it. And so as I've experienced extreme fulfillment in my life and still be able to manage success and staying grounded uh yeah i I want other people to experience what it's like to yeah have simultaneous success and fulfillment so that's how the coaching came to place i was like i you know the same pain that i had in the past i got to help guys get past it yeah you know there's a uh there's a turn 
a phrase that I use sometimes on the podcast. A, f- a friend of mine, uh, Aaron Allen Hondrino, introduced me to it, which is blissfully dissatisfied. Mm-hmm. And when I heard those two words together and I, and I go, well, listen, I can be happy mm-hmm. in my life and I can live with a sense of dissatisfaction as well because that's mm-hmm. what drives me. Sure. And the, the mirroring of those two, like I am happy to always be hungry Mm-hmm. but I can finally acknowledge that my plate is full mm-hmm. and like that, I mean, that's, uh, that's a powerful thing. And it takes, it takes a while to get there. I'm just on the other side of it, just mm-hmm. finally recognizing that part of my life. What was it for you that kind of like opened your eyes to it? So you, what was it your, was it a certain book? Was it like, what, what started you down that path of like, okay, I have to mature in this way. It was pain first, man. I mean, like it, it became, it had to be a self-awareness of like, like you are really not, like you are not where you want to be, right? Like, and it was the pain of realizing that the way I was showing up in my marriage, man, I mean, between the uh, just not being a great husband, infidelity, not making good decisions with money, not making, you know, not spending time with my wife and kids. You look back at all this and I'm just like, what happened? <laughs> I can remember just being like, what happened? And there was a, there was a reluctance to look in the mirror because you don't want to face the, you don't want to face what's happening, you know? And so it just became a point for me where it was like, all right, it hurts bad enough to start trying to figure this out. Like, like I'm hurting bad enough to where I'm, I'm going to start figuring out. So for me, you know, I just remember, you know, I was like, all right, man, I mean, I, I'm a man of faith. I need to start kind of getting back into this. And so I've always, I've always had some pretty good relationships with some guys. And I, I called, I called a good friend of mine, man, never forget, man, Sean. I, I was like, man, we got to go to lunch. Like we got to go to coffee. We got to talk. And I was just like, and it was the first time that I was like, I gotta, like, I just need some help. I mean, yeah. you're a great guy. <laughs> like, like you, like, like I see how you live. We've known each other for a while, but I need some help. And he was like, man, I got you. And Pick up the phone, dude, <laughs> right? What? You're listening what? and you can relate. Pick up the phone, call somebody, pick up man. the phone, pick up the phone. And, and I don't mind. See, like now I don't mind being vulnerable so that other guys can be like, damn, like, you mean it's not just me. Right. And, you know, I used to, I used to listen to podcasts and, and, and listen to stuff. And sometimes it didn't resonate with me because it was just like, you know, I felt like it was like, whoa, the person is, whoa, is this? Like, I was like, you know what? I need to share with people like, you know, what's, what really happened. Me picking up the phone was not, a, was not weakness at all. It was the most wisdom I ever, the, probably the wisest thing I ever did. And yeah, it was weird at first. I was like, I don't even know what to say, how to do. I just need some, some help. And I never disclosed any of, you know, my, my mess but it was the start of me realizing like, you know, I can get some help with somebody just walking with me. And it wasn't a therapist. It wasn't this. And if, and if it's a therapist, cool, right? It doesn't matter, but you got to start making that decision. And so it was that I started, somebody, you know, told me about a men's Bible said, dude, I was reaching for anything. I was just like, I'll go wherever. And somebody said, hey man, we about to go start doing, you know, some, some cartwheels and some run dancing over here. Cause you can get some help. That'd have been like, what time? Anywhere. What time? I'm, I'm there anywhere but suffering and silence right i was just like i'm done with this like i need to i need to figure it out and i'm done trying to figure this out on my own because for me i kept being like i'll figure it out like i'll i'll do it and dude i'm a i'm typically a loner and the reason why i've been that way is because i've been able to get everything done on my life by in my life by just doing it like on my own but it got to a place where I was like, yeah, this ain't gonna work because I kept trying to do that same thing to get out of the hole, to get out of the rut, to get unstuck, but it just wasn't happening. And I can relate so, so well. I would, I broke so many promises to myself trying to climb what? out of that. <laughs> so many problems. Like, all right, I sit down, I got my, my blank sheet of paper. This is what I'm going to do. This dude, is how I'm going to do it. Sunday night by Tuesday. I'm like, shit, I can't wait till next Sunday. So I could pull that paper out and write it all down again. Cause again. This, week, this week is gone. Uh, again. Years like that. 
Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so many broken promises, man. And and in the past, you know, just, you know, and just beating myself up. Like I know what it was like, just, you know, destroyed by shame and just I should have. And, you know, I think I heard somebody, we maybe even heard somebody say at the conference that we met at talking about, you know, people, you know, shouldn't all over themselves. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and yeah, I was, I was, was I, I was, uh, Brian, I was the, Brian Bogarty, I think said that yeah, because you know, yeah. he doesn't like the word should he's people should all over themselves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. He said, trying to eliminate that from the, from the English vocabulary. Yeah. But yeah, man, it, it, it was, it was pain for me. And then I had always been a personal development guy, right? Like I had always been a mindset guy, I'd always been a pretty high performing guy. Um, so yeah, that then led to, it led to books, it led to conferences, it led to things of, you know, getting educated. And then just like anything else, man, it was like, what are the, what are the habits that I'm going to put in place to, to, to change? Yeah. And over time, it was putting those habits in to get to a place to where, you know, you can put habits in place to, to, to keep you fulfilled. You put habits in, in place to just like you would for, for success. And so I just, you know, the, the outcomes that I wanted to have in life in these different areas of life in my, in, you know, in my family life and my marriage and my health, my wealth, my career, you know, my, 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 my purpose and calling as a coach, I was like, how do I envision these things happening? And what are the things that I need to put in place? What's the mindset I need to have behind that to make sure that it's all moving in the right direction. And, um, you know, it took time, just like anything, man, work in progress, but, um, I can, I can say now I am on the other side and then still moving. I don't think we ever get there, right? We, we never arrive. If you know, anybody, rinse anybody, do every day. Yes, yes, yes. Hundred percent. Do rent uh -huh. is definitely do every day. So yeah, man, just work in progress. So hey, you've done some pretty uh, interesting stuff, some impressive yeah. stuff here, man. You've, you're a highly sought after, high performance coach, and your book. Uh, Elite, a modern success guide to purpose and peak performance. Dude, talk about your book a little bit, man. It's a bestseller. Yeah. It's awesome. It's uh, like, yeah. like what, what's the story behind writing the book? I imagine it's a distillation of some of the things that we talked about here, but like, how, how did you, uh, how did you decide you wanted to, uh, to write Elite? So here's what's crazy. So when I look at, when I look back in college, I remember the first time I spoke in front of a, a group of people, an audience of people. And man, I was a nervous wreck. Oh my gosh. It was, it was an absolute mess, but something happened. And I remember like right before I started speaking, there was this calm that came that I was like, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Like, this is something I'm supposed to be doing. And like, when I was done, there was, you know, this, you know, roaring applause. And I was just like, dude, this is going to happen again at some point in my life. Like, <laughs> I don't know how you saw that locker room again in your head. That's what happened, man. You... <laughs> and I didn't know how it was going to happen. And, and, you know, fast forward, all this stuff happens. I reach out to, a, a, a you know, I reach out to some guys. I, you know, I kind of start walking through life. Things are getting better. And then I was like, you know what, dude, I want to help people get to this place, but I don't have no idea how this works. I have no idea where to start. And so I hired a business coach, a guy who had helped other coaches, you know, really kind of get started, get some clarity on, on, on what their message was going to be. And, and so he and I started working together and he was like, dude, you got to get your thoughts together in, in terms of the framework of how you see things and how, you know, how you went from where you were successful and stuck, but high performing and now fulfilled, you got to write it down. And it made me think about what happened step by step. And it was like, don't just write it down. But if you were to tell someone from start to finish, now that you've learned how you've gotten from point A to point B, what would you do different? You know, what order would you tell them to go through? And that was really kind of what started the coaching. It's interesting because me writing the book got my framework, you know, pretty clear of how to walk guys from start to finish. And, um, or to at least start to get on the right path. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I put it all down and, um, you know, it's a, it's a quick read. <laughs> yeah. Read and it's something that I offer a lot of times to guys, if they're just really trying to get started, trying to get some clarity around where they are, trying to get some self-awareness and, and, and how do you get on the right path? And, you know, man, you know, launched a book through the grace of God. I had enough people who I think liked it and told some other people about it. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, you know, it turned into something that I believe is, is good value for, for everyone. And it's interesting. I, 
the messages that I talk about and the things that I, I want to help people you know, understand and apply to their lives is really for men and women. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, like if for any ladies who are listening, anything I talk about can be applied to your life as well. I just have a passion for working with guys because I feel that if I can get guys on the right path, that, that there's just a trickle effect that's going to happen. Not that it wouldn't ha happen with females, but like what I realized in my own home is that as I started taking extreme ownership of, of me and knowing that I was the common denominator of everything that was happening in my home as a husband, leader, as a father, that when I started to change, Jake, everybody in my house started to change. And so if I can do that for other households, by just focusing on the man, dude, I think it can create some, some massive change and impact. So that's why I work with men. Yeah. You know, you, you said something a little bit earlier. Uh, I, I love the phrase that you use. You said successful and stuck. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an interesting demographic of, uh, of, of people. I think there's uh, people who need kind of a kick in the ass that need to get started, right? And that usually is someone being kind of disgusted with themselves. Like, oh, I, I have so much potential, I'm not using it. Yeah. Versus somebody who has had some level of success, they typically have this big ego or tend to have an ego kind of wrapped around that. So how do you address ego for that demographic of folks, like high performers? Are they usually pretty open to change as, as they seek, seek it out? Or is it one of those things that you just got to take the chisel out? Yeah, yeah. So great question. So the people that I love to work with are the ones that have hit a brick wall, right? Like their ego has come to an end. Like yeah. <laughs> they've, come, they've, they've come to the end of themselves because, dude, that was me. I did every freaking thing I could possibly do to, to try and fix things you know, on my own, because I was like, I can do it. I got it until I came to the end and was just like, ah, damn, like, all right, I surrender. Like I give up. Yeah. And it was when I became the most coachable. Okay. Because I was like, there's nothing else I can do. And as much as it hurt me to say that back then, I enjoy working with guys who are like, all right, I don't know what else to do because I know they're open. Now, here's, here's what's crazy, Jake. And you know this, man. We got a lot, of, a lot of men, a lot of guys out here who are on that path. They're successful, but they're stuck or they're driving themselves into the ground. And it's just a matter of time before they get to this point to where they're either trying to keep it up and they know things aren't well personally and maybe even in what they do for, for their career or business and they can keep going down that path because it hurts too much to, to say, I need to try to fix this. I need some help. And to, you know, break the mold that they've shown to everybody, take off the mask that, you know, it, it, it ain't all, you know, uh, lilies and, and daisies in life, yeah. right? It ain't all the Ferrari and the, you know, the nice homes and all that stuff. They can keep going down that path or they'll be like, dude, something's got to change. Now, for those ones who keep going down the path, it's just me continuing to tell this story until they just like, damn, like, okay, <laughs> right? But there has to be some level of self-awareness that they're like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not... I'm just not where I want to be. And until that happens, it's, it's difficult. So I say successful and stuck. The ones who know that they're stuck are the ones that I would prefer to work with. If somebody is beyond a shadow of doubt, I feel like they ain't got no problems. We ain't got nothing to talk about. A hundred percent. Yeah. We ain't I got think, nothing to talk about. I, I think the other thing here too, is once you admit that you have a problem and once you kind of put your hands up and say, Hey, I need some help. Like, getting to the point where you forgive yourself. I'm a big fan of self-forgiveness. I'm a big fan of like, hey, you're not where you want to be and that's okay because you're a human being and human beings don't always do exactly what they want to do all the time. <laughs> like it's, it's just, it's just life. So like, mm -hmm. sorry, it's okay. You yeah. made a couple of the wrong decisions. Uh, let's hit the edge of sketch and draw a new path and like, let's go to another together. Like that's, it, it, it's profound and it's simple. 
and, and it's something that we were reluctant to do as humans at, all, all the time. All the time. And look, man, I was, I was raised the guilty, the, the, the guilty Catholic. Right. So, I mean, it was even, you know, exponential for me, like, Oh my gosh, like I got to sit in this thing for a while before I do anything. Right. Yeah. But, but you know, you, you said something key there is, is forgiving yourself, man. I mean, dude, I mean, and this is something that you have to really practice because when you find yourself constantly thinking about what was done in the past, constantly kind of beating yourself up for what happened, like, Dude, you will not be able to get past it until you forgive yourself. Matter of fact, people talking about forgiving other people. It's like, no, nah, man, like start working on forgiving yourself before you start forgiving other people. When you start forgiving yourself for stuff, it'll be easier for you to give for you to forgive yeah. other people. When you hold on to that stuff, you'll start holding it on to, you know, to other people or continue to. And yeah, that's huge, dude. Huge. So you've got an elite performance blueprint. It's got three fairly straightforward, fairly simple steps. You mind sharing yeah. those with us here and kind of unpacking them lightly just uh, just so we can have kind of a yeah. high level of your program. What's it about? Yeah, man, there's really three pillars to the program. Uh, one is strengthening your faith. So um, that's the spiritual growth piece. So strengthening your faith. The second part is um, personal development or really it's, it's, it's mindset, you know, really strengthen in the mind, if you will. And then the third piece is, you know, basically practical habits, you know, practical habits that we can put in place um, from the strengthening of the mind, from the strengthening of our faith, put those into daily practice. And here's what I know is that, you know, if you create time and space to put those things in, then there's just an inevitability to outcome on the other end. Uh, you know, time is on your side in terms of consistency of putting in the, the habits that turn into, you know, high performance in all areas of life. So uh, to kind of unpack the first one, uh, you know, I'm a man of faith. We, we were joking whenever we were at the conference that, you know, I met because, you know, somebody would say something, I'd be in the back, like yelling, like preach, like, come on. Preach. So people, people, <laughs> it became funny, right? Because I mean, you know, when someone would say something that just resonated with me, I'd be like, come on now, you know, preach. Yeah. So faith has been something that's been a, a big part of me in my, you know, in my relationship with God. And so that first piece for me is I really help guys, uh, you know, in, in that area, try to develop a relationship with God. And, and, you know, I don't exclude people and I don't push my beliefs on people, but for people who have similar beliefs as me, who feel like they've fallen off their faith, uh, you know, I really help them get grounded in, in building, building a personal, like tangible relationship with God, just like you and I are talking. Sure. And what that's done for me is just, it's created a bunch of peace. It's created peace of mind. It's created fulfillment. It's created the ability to not depend on anything external from me for my fulfillment. Yeah. Right. So, so I don't depend on anything external or outside of me in order to be fulfilled. And so um, that's that first piece. Second piece is, is just it, it, mine. Yeah if, yeah, if I could touch on that too, I think it's really, really important that you talked about not excluding folks of different faiths or, or, or whatever it is. It's like that conversation goes back to the anchor point that we talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you're the anchor point, yep. you're, gonna, you're gonna summit at some point in time and then you're gonna be sitting there unfulfilled. But if you can actually have that conversation, yeah, you go to a level of depth, and understand at least functionally what your place is in the world and what you expect out of your existence. Yeah. And I think it's what so many people aren't doing right now is expecting it. And, and if that's a relationship with God and if that's yeah. a, you know, fantastic. But if you walk around with that undefined, you are missing out on a major part of moving forward. Yeah. And, and so it just offers a lot of, it, it, you mentioned something so key anchoring. I'm going to steal that from you because that's exactly yeah, what it does. It, it anchors you to be able to be like, you know what, this is almost kind of like true North. Like I've got a compass, right? And, you know, uh, my beliefs may be different from someone else's, Jake, and, and, and that's fine. I, I don't put, dude, let me tell you, my, my goal, one of my goals in life is just to literally love unconditionally anybody, no matter what your beliefs are, is just to literally love. What I've understood is I've built that relationship with God is that 
there's an unconditional love that comes my way. So I'm not saying, oh my gosh, why do you believe this? Why do you do that? Why do you not believe what I believe? What I believe is right. And, and we ain't going there. I'm going to say, look, I love you. And if you, and if you die with what I'm talking about, we can keep moving forward. If not, it's still okay. Like, I love you. <laughs> like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, it's all good. But I love that that's, approach, man. That, that is, that is phenomenal. We need more of that in the world, man. I, dude. I mean, it's, it, it's what I've experienced and, and why would I not pass that on once I've, experience that in in my personal relationship with god so so that's all i'm trying to do now um you know once we have that anchor once i know that this is true north for me well now it's about you know what do you like how do you want life to look like you know for so many of us you know we're 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 trying to achieve things we're trying to 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 get to the next level of things we're trying to advance and progress and oftentimes, many of us, we're just focusing on the wrong thing. I mean, I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where, you know, I've had this thought like, okay, if I'm trying to lose weight, I'm just, and this will probably resonate with you because you and I had some big conversations about weight loss and stuff like this. But if you just take a goal of like losing weight, most people are going to be like, well, if I just work harder, <laughs> like if I just put in more time in the gym, then I will lose weight. And they're not wrong. But the problem is they're just not going deep enough, man. They're not going deep enough to, to their thoughts, their feelings, their beliefs, their internal identity of who they think they are. And until that changes, until the, the identity shifts, until, you know, the, the, and, and until the, the, the core person internally really kind of shifts the way they think, then you will not achieve or perform at a level that is greater than the way you think or see yourself. You yeah. just won't. And so most of us won't get deep enough. And so we'll say, well, if I could just do the next course, or if I could just call more people, yes, those are the tasks that need to be done to create results. But oftentimes those tasks aren't getting done because there's a belief, there's an underlying belief that's either holding it, that's holding us back in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So this personal development piece is starting to understand true identity, like, yeah. and really, you know, really just start shaving off all of the mess to get down to who you truly are. Most people feel like they're so far removed from who they want to be when the reality is, no, that person is there. <laughs> it's not that I got to reach and, you know, crawl to be this person. You're that person. It's more about shaving off all the mess so we can get down to the fact that, yes, you've been this person this entire time. We just got to get you believing the right things about you to start fostering new thoughts and feelings that would be the person who's actually in shape and eating the right things. You just don't think you're that person. That's why you're showing up that way in, in the world. Doesn't mean that you're not the person who you desire to be. So, we work on it and unpack a lot of that stuff on that second piece of that, you know, personal development mindset piece. I love it. Just getting people comfortable in their skin, man. Just getting comfortable. You know, who, who am I? Like, you know, the, the closing that gap or that disconnect that people have and who they think they are versus who they actually are, you know? <laughs> and I have my best memories when I'm around people who are being authentic, regardless if they're, every, regardless if they're having, doing behaviors that I don't care for, or like I don't agree with. I have my best times, my best memories with people who just show up and are authentic and true to themselves and are unapologetic about, and that's George Bryan, obviously, like unapologetically oh, authentic. Yep. He's such a, a phenomenal example for that. Just showing up, hey, this is who I am. I'm either for you or I'm not for you. This is who I am right now. I'm willing to change. Not right now. Let's go. Like, <laughs> I love it. Right. That's, and, and that's it. And so many people feel like it's this, like, you know, we talk about journeys or, or being on a journey, but like we see ourselves, like the person that we want to be. And we talk about visions and goals is like, it seems so far away, like, but it's not. I think people need to shift the way they think in terms of like, man, I'm so far away from, from, the the weight loss goal. I'm so far away from the business that I want to start. I'm so far away from the money I want to earn. All this stuff, it's, it's more like, no, it's more like a piece of um, like rock or, or uh, something that you would shave down like a, like a sculptor, yeah. like the masterpiece is there. 
it's just about chipping away the mess, like chipping away the, the, the flawed way of thinking to get to the masterpiece. It's been there. It's, it's, it is there. The only problem is, is, is we, we just can't see it unpacked through all of the stuff. So if we could just like shave off a little bit of the, I can't a little bit of the, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an emotional eater or, or I just can't make money or like, like all of these false things that we've limiting gone beliefs, into all, that, yeah. all the limiting be- stuff. You can get down to the person who's, who like understands and like, Oh dude, that's just mess. I see that's just noise. And I can start to focus on, cause dude, the world is going to try to convince you. The world is probably already convincing you. I mean, it still convinces me. I am like I said, I haven't arrived. I've just got some things in place to make sure that I can get the right mindset in place to, to, to not believe what the world is trying to convince me or conform me into being, uh, you know, just a worker bee like everybody else, just kind of conforming to, to the way life is. And until you take ownership of your own mind, <laughs> Yeah. And put the things in there that's required in order to get the, the end result. I don't care how hard you work on the action. It's not going to change. So it's not going to change. So you got the spiritual growth. You've got the personal development. Yeah. The last piece that kind of binds this stuff together. You said something around performance improvement or micro yep. habits or something along to maybe take me through that. Yeah. So performance improvement and basically this is like, you know, habit application. So this is putting the habits in place that, uh, from a strengthening your faith and mindset perspective that we start to, what we've learned in those first two modules, we now start to put into practice um, in the form of having routines daily of mindset practices, having routines daily of getting grounded, spending time breathing and meditating uh, these are the practical things that has to happen that actually move, you know, and creates change in your life. It's not, you know, uh, it's not just, let me just take action. Let me just take more action with this. We have to take right action. Yeah. You have to be, uh, you know, uh, effective. I, I tell people there's a difference between efficiency and being effective. Efficient is doing something you know, being able to get a lot done and, and, you know, in less time and all that. But if you're running in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter. And that's being effective. So it's the, the more effective habits that need to be put in place up here and done consistently over time that eventually turns into the actions that need to be done that create results. I love it. And, you know, if I can just kind of piggyback on this as well, one of the most profound realizations I've ever had in my life is that for the rest of my life, I'm going to have to, on some frequency, remind myself who I am and what it is that I do. <laughs> and it sounds crazy uh, that, you know, and, and I love incantations and mantras and creeds and those types of things. Mm-hmm. I love sitting down and, you know, and, and I have a, a coaching program uh, as well. And, you know, mm-hmm. I have my clients kind of sit down and, and go through this process of like, really understanding who they are and why they want to do the things that they want to do and remind themselves of it all the time and how those strategies turn to action in their actual day-to-day life is critical. (laughs) Dude, most of us, we want to be so busy. Like there's, there's just this busyness of life. We don't want to stop long enough to possibly realize we're running in the wrong direction. Yeah, for sure. It's just a reality, dude. Yeah. Like, I want to continue being busy so that I'm doing something. Yeah. But the question is, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? <laughs> are you, I mean, and are you going to own up to the possibility that maybe you're not? I mean, I think busyness, just being busy is just a sophisticated form of laziness, of not wanting to look at what, may be a problem for us to keep. I've never thought of it as tier two laziness. <laughs> I'm stealing that. Busyness is tier two laziness. <laughs> that is, wow. That, yeah, we got to stop. Most of us don't slow down long enough. I mean, dude, you and I just came back from a conference where the first day, the whole entire first day was committed to slowing down. Yeah. 
like the whole first day, people were sitting there like, when are we going to get to like, you know, the stuff about building business? And he was like, no, nah, man, you got to slow down. You have to create space and time to think. But most of us don't want to stop long enough to realize that we've been going, we might be headed in just slightly the wrong direction, or maybe we're just completely off. You know what? It feels better to just keep on running and getting busy and getting the same and, and just not getting the results that we want. Okay, cool. Yeah. Have at it. I do more thinking right now than I probably ever have, but it also allows me to be more effective so I don't have to do as much work. Well, man, you're all over the place right now. You got that I coaching stuff going. Place, you, you, I'm everywhere. You got that doctor thing going, man. Hey, how do people easily find you on social media or on, on the web? Where's the, where's the place that people go? Yeah, so um, social media, his was crazy. I, I hang out on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably the best place to reach out to me. But I look at Instagram. <laughs> like, like Instagram <laughs> you is consume just, it. <laughs> I don't, yeah, like Instagram is my little guilty pleasure, right? Yeah, I got you. <laughs> me too. And, and you know, I'm on all the platforms, Jake. I'm on, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, this, that, and the other. But like the one that I kind of like, like, let me just see what's going on is Instagram. Yeah. I don't know why, maybe it's the pictures. I don't know what's going on, but that's the one I kind of, but you can, you can reach out to me on any one of, but I probably easiest one that I really respond to quick is be LinkedIn, man. And it's, everything is at Dr. Brad, D-R-B-R-A-D-M-D, uh, Dr. Brad M-D. So you can reach out to me, man. I'd be happy to connect with you. And then my website is drbradmd.com. So everything is pretty simple. And on there, you know, we got the the podcast that I've got, we've got, you know, some resources and stuff to be able to help some folks. So that's phenomenal. And I know coming out of COVID here, you got any uh, speech speaking engagements planned yet or anything like that? I know that that's just starting to take off in some parts of the country. And I know you're a, an active uh, public speaker. Yeah. So um, really, I'm just hitting this podcast circuit, man. Oh, like to it. me, this is, this is fun. I, I just, I enjoy having genuine, authentic conversations with, with, with people that I'm in alignment with, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You know, uh, when we met at the con, I mean, it was just easy. I was like, yeah, man, this, this guy, this right. guy gets it. <laughs> Dr. Brad, I appreciate that, man. And uh, I, you know, certainly I feel the same way about you. I mean, uh, shout out to George Bryant for putting on one of the best yeah. conferences I've ever been to that yeah, relationship man. speed algorithms at three days in Montana absolutely blew my mind. And if anybody's smart, they'll go follow him on social media as well. I, I agree. That next event, man, that was, uh, that was very, profound and powerful for me. And, and I hope it was for you as well. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for spending about an hour with me today. Thanks for unpacking your story. Uh, yeah, and man. again, man, I wish you nothing but the best uh, in love and life, brother. Jake, man, I appreciate just the willingness to, uh, to share your genius with the world and, and the fact that you have me on your podcast. I feel honored. Thanks, man. And uh, I already know you got great things planned, even in addition to what you've already done, man. So appreciate you. All right. Cheers, Dr. Brad. Thank you.